Shane Kilkelly, and you're listening to General Intellect Unit in collaboration with Swampside Chats. This time we're picking up part two of our discussion of the human use of human beings by Norbert Wiener. If you didn't catch the first part, I'd recommend pausing this episode, going back one and starting from there. As always, thanks for listening and we hope you enjoy the show. The chapter then kind of closes on it, like going on from that evolutionary stuff to the, the kind of problems of extinction, and particularly this kind of problem of overfitting, where a runaway process drives a species into the ground. And he uses the example of, I don't know, some kind of dinosaur or whatever, where if you look at their fossils, over time you can see that their, their bodies get bigger and bigger, uh, which means that they're, they, they find them, it's harder and harder to actually feed. But the, the bodies get bigger in proportion to this like horn thing that they've got. Like the, the antlers become more and more elaborate. And because you need, a, you need then need a bigger neck to hold them, you need bigger shoulders to hold the neck and stuff. This ends up in a place where the the species has somehow like burrowed its way into the ground. It's it's become like hyper adapted at something that it didn't even want, um, and becomes trapped as a kind of giant lumbering species that's very finds it very difficult to feed itself. Um, I think he seems to think that this is probably happening right now to bourgeois society, where it is driving itself into the ground through a runaway feedback loop. Um, it is it is painting itself into a corner. Uh, evidence in 2020 suggests he was correct. Uh, Way ahead of his time. He names and <laughs> he, he names pandemics. Like he names like um, the fact that you know a disease could be spread by a plane, like. He names right. this like as being one of the fragilities of the system. Oh my god, uh, he, he does. Names- and, and, yeah. and 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 explicitly one of the reasons why a world government would be necessary. Yeah. Right. And world state here as it appears here is is something that is sort of a logical outgrowth and not as subject as critique uh, not as subject to critique as the end of the book, but like yeah, like it, that appears as a necessity. He points to resource scarcity in particular in exactly the manner that, you know, I don't know, Andreas Malm and Jasper Burns are, you know, trading kind of like uh, th- thought processes, you know, going like note for note on, you know, cobalt extraction or whatever, or on climate change and the, the ability for humanity to kind of overcome, you know, resource scarcity, all that stuff. Like is 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 all here, you know, and of course it's a lot bigger than debates in Marxism, but like uh, that tension is being played out here in, in 1950. This is before Silent Spring and environmentalism, you know, becoming like a something of a movement. This is remarkable. This is this is a rem- really remarkable book. Mm-hmm. It um, is. It's hard not to see the last bit as a like the last paragraph as a sort of cybernetic socialist plea. I, I got it. I got it here. Um, so this is top of page 58. We need to cultivate fertility of thought as we have cultivated efficiency in administration. We need to find some mechanism by which an invention of interest to the public may effectively be dedicated to the public. We cannot afford to erode the brains of the country as we have eroded, the, eroded its soil. We must not be serfs written down as property in the books of our entrepreneurs. We need a system in which variability and adaptability are at a premium and not as a, at a discount. We need an organization that is awake to the facts of invention and of our ever greater dependence on more invention. If man is to continue to exist, he must not be an afterthought to business. That one attempt to realize this has bogged down in the present ruthless phase of the totalitarianism of Russia should not blind us to the fact that these problems exist, and if we do not answer them, we shall perish as individuals and perish as a race. Give us the freedom to face the facts as they are. We need not expect that the race will survive forever, any more than that we shall survive forever as individuals. But we may then hope that both as individuals and as a race, we may live long enough to bring into the open these potentialities which lie in us. Hell yeah. Yeah. What a fucking line. Yeah, yeah. This is right after kind of excoriating, you know, the notion, like, uh, social Darwinist adaptability, comparing businessmen to tapeworms, um, <laughs> <laughs> like, that their adaptability doesn't say anything about, you know, doesn't confer any virtue on them. And I think it's crystal clear. Well, he all- also identifies Marxism with the ideal of everyone being able to um, 
realize their potential. Yeah. Yeah. The full expression of each is the full expression of all. Yeah. Yeah. So when he says that, you know, we need a society where we can bring into the open the potentialities that lie within us. He's essentially asking for communism. <laughs> it's a paraphrase. This is a paraphrase yeah. of Marx. Yeah. It is. Like, yeah, you, yeah, it it's is, crypto. Yeah. It's deep crypto. Mm -hmm. But it's fucking right there. I definitely, like, as I said earlier, like, I think this, this is a person who had the good sense to keep their head down, but didn't keep it down enough. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, knock, knock, it's, knock. It's there, you know? Um, all that stuff does it, it then kind of, like, the, you know, the potentialities of, the, of each person, right, is, is kind of what he's getting at in Chapter 3, then. Rigidity and learning. Two patterns of communicative behavior. Where he, he basically says that ants are fascists. Um, or that the, the fascist desire for a um, ordered society in which each person is allocated their, their job and they perform it perfectly is that they desire an ant society, like an ant hive. But this is physiologically impossible. That the, the, for, for Wiener, this is not only reprehensible, it's actually a foolish thing to want because you'll never actually get it. Because humans and ants have extremely different nervous systems and have extremely different like development. So an ant is essentially a 3D printed robot. It is more or less fixed. Like, it doesn't grow very much, its nervous system is extremely limited, and it doesn't learn very much. The hive in general will learn, but it's, that's because the hive is a weird organism where its cells are the ants. Um, that's contrasted with humans who have an extremely long childhood in which the brain grows a lot. And so basically, like, the, the way that ants survive is printed into their, their being, but the way, that humans, the way that humans survive is also printed into our being, but not in that way. Because learning is the thing that's printed into our being, which is, means that for the ant, its behavior is always rooted directly in its particular context, like what it's doing right now. Whereas with learning, um, human behavior is smeared out through time. Like a, a, a human's behavior in a given moment is not particularly tightly related to its exact context. It's related to the whole history of its learnings and its context. In this way, these intelligent beings, and like human beings aren't the only, th only things that do this, but you know, it's a good contrast against the ant. These intelligent learning beings are folding their internal state with their context constantly and, and updating their uh, neural circuitry and learning and developing memories and forming new connections and all this sort of stuff. That's the nature of human beings, and to try to make them into ants by smashing them down and reducing their variety is, as, as I said, reprehensible, but it's also foolish. It's like you're, you're not going to get the result you want because the, I think, what, what does he say? That like a person that is treated in this way will not, they will not be a very good ant and they will not be a very good person either. Yeah, this is the part where I think um, his sort of like cybernetic approach to uh, biology and physiology is really good. Like, I think, like, he's he's making an argument that's actually, like, based in real physiology as opposed to sort of, like, uh, abstract notions of uh, the divide between animals and humans that don't have any factual basis. Uh, so, uh, like, I, I really like this. Uh, I really like this section. Um, it's, it's very good. Uh, it's real nice. And I think it's also kind of telling as well that, like, by this metric... You know, I, th I think maybe what you were getting at earlier, Kyle, with like these these different these kinds of domination, right? That like the the, the Soviet Union wasn't particularly good at treating people as if they weren't ants either. You know, the sort of um, stamping machine annihilation of of, um, of, of humanity in, in that system wasn't particularly good either. Um, yeah, it, w it was it was really a uh, it was really a system at odds with itself because it had an extremely strong emphasis on education. Uh, but at the same time, it was extremely emphatic about the rigid uh, classification of people into into roles. Yeah, um, it's also in this part that we get the he really develops the idea of like thought as practical engagement in the world. Right, that it's it's via thought and information that we adapt ourselves to the world and adapt the world to ourselves, like this reciprocal coupling, this like multi-dimensional reciprocal coupling of all, all beings to each other in this kind of weird multi-perspectival dance of agency. And that's, that's what communication really is. It's, it's the synchronization and adaptation of behavior um, rather than like, you know, packets of information being a kind of primary thing in their own right. Um, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to read into this a deep antipathy for central planning as it's practiced in the Soviet Union. Um, he 
couches it mainly in terms of the fascist anthill. Um, this is where he makes a gesture towards how lab heads and businessmen probably don't actually like democracy that much and then proceeds to describe a fascist anthill. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's pretty clear that this kind of, you know, sorting hat society that attenuates your variety and reduces you to a cog is just as applicable to the Soviet Union. I mean, I was just going to say with like uh, this kind of anthill, you know, vision of like fascism, it, what's funny is I think, you know, we're actually not going to get anything really like that in the long run. You know, I think that especially with like lumpenization, what's the old expression? The only thing worse than being exploited by capital is not being exploited by capital. So, it's, Joan so you know, there's just there's just all of this uh, sort of surplus humanity that do, doesn't even get to be a cog, you know, and they and. The bourgeoisie has to sort of manage, you know, because it's very easy when there's like, yeah, machine work for everybody. You put this person at this spot, that person at that spot. When it's all like more increasingly automated, how do you have class composition? How do you have like a functional society? You know, I don't know if the bourgeoisie has an answer for this or is capable of answering it. Um, I, I, I have a lot of comments about sort of like the bets that – Wiener makes and the way things actually turned out. <laughs> I don't know if this is the right place to talk about them, but you know, he talks in this book about how uh, the 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 engineer or the scientist, uh, this sort of technician of knowledge, um, is becoming ever more sort of like an operator of machines, uh, ever less a a kind of uh, universal individual, and how. In fact, the kind of lab director has a sort of fascist mentality uh, it, it, within him. Uh, now, he points out a very real problem there, uh, but he doesn't really anticipate the quote-unquote solution we arrived at, which is that uh, the kind of like the, the tech bro capitalist becomes the universal human. Because capital is universal, then by being the personification of capital and the personification of capital investment, he assumes the mantle of, of universality. Uh, so instead of getting, you know, a kind of more enlightened form of laboratories uh, or a kind of like collective humanity that is moving towards universality, we instead get these exemplars of, of universal humanity, uh, which are sort of worshipped, given tremendous social uh, and economic power, and um, really more closely approximate the uh, fascist ideal of individuality than Wiener seems to understand uh, of fascism. Uh, fasc uh, Wiener seems to like Wiener attributes to fascism this idea that everyone should be ants, uh, but it's not really the that's that's not really what the fascist ideal was. Much more Stalinist. That is much more Stalinist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. The, the 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 fascist idea is that you have you have NPCs and you have PCs basically. Right, right, right. You you have real humans and you have the background characters who support their their existence right it's the difference between uh, uh an ant hive like the borg were originally posited as and then the borg once they introduced the borg queen you know who is this like all feeling mm -hmm. like individual who's a sort of directing agent of the hive you know it's a difference yeah, exactly. between an emergent hive system and uh, this is something wiener will actually get into later in the book but an agent that powers the hive well, I mean, yeah, his vision of fascism is the liberal vision of fascism. Yes. Because fasci like, fascism, I think, has to be read as, like, almost a dynamic process of reaction, usually to sort of a rising proletarian movement. And it takes many different forms and wildly different ideologies. You know, the fascism of, um, like, Franco is not the same thing as Nazism. It's not the same thing as um, Mussolini or the guy who overthrew uh, Allende. Uh, Pinochet, right? So it, there's the uh, like its historical role and its role in 
uh, class societies, maybe the better way to look at fascism. Um, his vision of like the ants thing is very much kind of liberals um, conflating basically the, the – they see the authoritarianism mixed with kind of the natural seriality of mass industrial society. Um, and as far as like Stalinism goes, I guess the difference is with Stalinism at the very least saw what they were doing as a means to an end. In other words, we pass through this industrial drive and then everything's so productive that we arrive at like the communist future and all of this shittiness will be retroactively justified by history, right? Um, so it's, you know, yeah, it, it, this vision that he has of like the ants thing, I think is an intrinsically liberal, uh, vision. Mm -hmm. I think, I think he's indexing something very real that happens to go by many different names and is, is a component part of a lot of different things. Uh, but yeah, as you say, he, he filters it through this like black pilled lib sort of lens and like calls it what he, what it's quite. It's Koyana Squatsy, mm -hmm. you know? Like, let's zoom out. Oh, look at this. Like, uh, mm -hmm. city <laughs> yeah, looks like a totally. microchip. Look at all the ants racing around. Yeah, you know? totally. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, but, yeah, I'm just saying he didn't, he didn't anticipate the solution to the problem he was addressing. Uh, and and it's, it's com something completely out of left field that, like, isn't even in this schematism. Yeah, even when I was reading his, like kind of plea for cybernetic socialism. I don't think he could imagine, excuse me, I don't think he can imagine a world of attenuated variability with heightened adaptivity, you know? Like, and that's, that's like what you get with the selection process from the mass proletariat. People just please, I just want to, let me be a cog. The cog is where you get your self-esteem. Let me be a cog here. Like, I promise I won't like rock the boat too much. I'll I'll shave off some of the edges of my variability, like to be as like fit in the box as possible. But I'll adapt. I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll learn. I'll learn. I'm a learning machine. I'll just learn all the time. Like like he misses the boat on how that part can be gamed. Like, but um, but as we're you know talking shit, this is where he invents machine learning. This chapter right here. I'm taking like a. Like a, a Coursera, like open course on machine learning right now, and I just about spit out my coffee because he's describing learning, and then he just goes into describing the physiology of ants for like you know six pages, and I'm like, all right, dude. And then after all that, he's like, oh yeah, it's almost like l learning could be like done by machines, and like proceeds to describe exactly you know what's basically the hottest capitalist innovation right now. Yeah. Because he, he's the guy who tapped into, he, he recognized and named the very fundamental units of this kind of process, like feedback and, and memory and adaptation and, and dynamic adjustment. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's really weird how on the money he is with these predictions. Um, uh, the, the last thing that I wanted to say about chapter three is um, he names this, or he gets the central insight in cybernetic and the good kind of dialectical thought that the bad kind of dialectical thought has in common with, you know, bourgeois, like, metaphysics or whatever you call it in the Marxist tradition, you know, the bad kind of thought, where, um, and, like, anything that is sort of causally downstream is necessarily an epiphenomenon, is necessarily just some reflection that has no causal power. Um, and he's talking about psych psychology uh, as it emerges from people. Um, and wow, is that ever uh, is that ever relevant to historical materialism? Because when people read historical materialism, and this is in great part influenced by Stalinist readings, they cannot see anything that is like you know. Okay, so the Relations of production are downstream of the forces of production, right? Most people read that as relations of production, just an epiphenomenon of forces of production. The superstructure is downstream of the base. Most people read that as superstructure is just an epiphenomenon of the base. What they do not read into it is a special kind of emergent causality. That's the central insight of cybernetics that taps into exactly what Marx was trying to functionally get at in his theory of historical materialism. It's the key to reading historical materialism that, I mean, people straw man Marx, but also Marxists, like and even some more sophisticated Marxists to this day with this. Like 
people cannot imagine that something that emerges from something else can have a significant causal power, unique causal power, even though maybe the first thing is sort of more powerful in a way. Like maybe, uh, you know, the productive forces do exert this specific kind of, you know, immense, huge causality on the relations of production. But Jesus Christ, you cannot, you cannot undersell the special causality that the relations of production have in calling the forces of production into being. This reminds me of something very interesting we've come across in the beer brain of the firm reading group recently, right? That like, so what you're talking about there is feedback, right? That like A, a gives rise to B, B, B then influences A, A gives rise, to e, and then you get into a kind of weird feedback cycle where the two things kind of create each other, like co-emergence is, is, is a thing when you have those feedback cycles, then you multiply it out across N dimensions. With a kind of causal asymmetry, right? Like it's not the same kind of power, it's not even the same magnitude of power, but it's just a specialized you know, one thing can't cause the other in exactly the same way. Right. But what, this is the interesting thing that comes up in Beer, because Beer then has... So when Beer's talking about feedback, he has this thing where... Uh, and he, he sort of writes it out mathematically and kind of verifies it, that, like, feedback comes to dominate the circuit. So it's the feedback mechanism then actually has more causal power than the, the original thing. So... And he, he, he sort of... It's like, you know, if, if anyone's ever, you know been in the presence of a guitar amplifier that's going into feedback, it's squealing, right? It has this kind of thing come out. The initial input is tiny. It's just a teeny little note, but it rapidly goes around the circuit and goes and takes over everything. And so that's really strange, right? That like when energy is injected into a feedback circuit, the feedback effect can be vastly more consequential than any of the inputs ever were. So it's, it's, you're definitely on the right track there, Esri, right? That, like, the, in, in fact, the emergent effect can completely eclipse any of the, the, the original factors uh, that went into it. It's pretty fucking strange. But that takes another 30, 40 years to develop with, uh, with beer, right? Yeah, the, the, the forces of production can develop to the point where you can end hunger. And then, you know, because of the, of the relations of production and then the feedback loop between them, you know, you still have people starving while there's people in space or some mm -hmm. shit. Yeah, or right. like uh, another another Marxist version of this is you know Marx doesn't dispense with supply and demand. If anything, he's a bit of a supply side thinker, which makes him different from most you know liberal economists that are more demand side. But his insistence is on profitability, which is this interaction between supply and demand, and that's the real like driver of capitalism, not de supply or demand by you know by themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and like in, I think in Beer's terminology, it would be that the it's the it's the profitability dynamic that kind of eclipses either either of the inputs as as the main driver. Um, and that's how you get real genuine emergence, right? Is that like a, a truly new phenomenon emerges and um, and eclipses some of the previous things, even though they're still in play. And this 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 gets only worse when you multiply it out across so many different factors, right? That like everything is influencing everything else. Yeah, yeah. But his his preservation of specific types of causality, you know, like is is i think what i don't know it sort of clarifies to me like how what the difference between good systems thinking is and bad systems thinking i think maybe chapters four and five are kind of snooze um so let's get past them chapter six is where it gets interesting again uh, the individual as the word in which um his basic argument is that uh, he, he goes by way of a, a short story by Kipling uh, with the night mail where the guy imagines like this uh, fascist order of transportation where universal like air travel could, transmits power across the world or whatever. And then he basically says, well, you don't need to transport things. All you need to do is transport information because where, uh, what's, what's the phrase? Like where a man's word goes, he goes basically, right? That like um, his argument throughout all this is that it's the pattern of information that moves through matter that is the real process rather than the matter itself. So you can have an architect on one end of the world do up some plans and transmit them to another part of the world and it gets built locally based on those plans and it's, it's almost as if the architect was there. Um, yeah, the, so the, the cool part at the, at the end of... So he, he predicts machine learning and then at the end, at the end of chapter 6 he predicts Star Trek uh, transporters. Um, he's, he's saying that like... So it's this lesson again that like it's the pattern of information amongst matter that is the real show here. Like, the, the material itself is kind of a sideshow. And if you can, like, this is a world of patterns and information patterns and patterns that propagate themselves and patterns that sustain themselves. So an organism is a kind of closed pattern loop, which 
spends some of its energy on doing other things, but spends a lot of its energy on keeping itself maintained. Um, and he's just, yeah, yeah, transporters. I mean, if you could copy the pattern to another location and just rebuild it with different material, it's continuity, folks. That's, that's just it, you know? Yeah, because the self is a pattern. You know, you can, transfor you can transport uh, patterns uh, through information. And, uh, it's, you know, you can tell by the, um, what's the word? Sort of, you can tell by the metabolism of the human body and how quickly it ejects matter and rebuilds you that it's not your matter that makes you. It's this continuous process. And so, like, very frequently among Star Trek nerds, you know, there'll be the idea, well, transporting is just death. I don't see a way around it. It's very, like, it's pretty important to Star Trek that people aren't dying every time they transport. This is the underlying argument. You have this pattern buffer that like receives and preserves the pattern of self. And at the end, he's kind of like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. My intention here isn't to do some super bong rip Star Trek thing. But, <laughs> like, I'm just trying to prove the point that spreading information is actually more important than, um, tr like, actual transportation of physical things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the Kipling thing where he's like, he kind of sneers at that as like, tra transporting people by air transport is not fucking essential at all for this kind of like fascist colonial project. It's transporting the information is sufficient. And maybe that gives us, like, I think this would be worth it, I think, not in this call, but like in another call digging into of like, the difference between old school colonialism and the kind of new colonialism of like, domination via like, cybernetic fucking information circuit and like integration into a world market that it's like you don't even have to send folks there you don't you don't even have to put the cia boy, cia boys on the plane you can just fucking keep them at home and they can control it through the internet instead you know well you know the american imperial apparatus still involves a tremendous amount of air power it does right <laughs> so yeah uh, no it's, fly it's zone not, you know it's not purely a matter of signals but uh it is you know, the the interest of American military planners is like having that air power, but, but then on top of that, having the command and control systems to make that effective, which is with the, which is the signals to mention. Right. Just having the air power is not sufficient. Um, that's something that's existed since like the Second World War. Right. It, this is this is a, a higher level of, of power. And I think in that regard, he's correct. Yeah, judicious use of air power so that you only really have to use it when things, when the information patterns aren't sufficient. Like, the information patterns should be sufficient. But, um, and I guess this is where I get my, like, causal asymmetry thing from. Yes, information is very powerful, but nothing quite drives the point home like, you know, a big explosion. Mm -hmm. Like, one of them is, is relatively unignorable, even to the most practiced, like, stoic. <sighs> Absolutely right. Um, I think maybe the next interesting chapter then is maybe chapter eight, um, communication and secrecy in the modern world. Um, this is kind of, I mean, maybe there's, there's not much to it. There's, there's a lot of this middle part of the book where he's very concerned with like the problem of like intellectual property and patents, right? And how this is like stifling science and stuff like that. But he also gets into how, um, the notion of patenting, uh, and hoarding, information is kind of fundamentally wrong-headed, right? That, like, information is the lifeblood of... Um, I don't know, so I, I, there's, there's a quote here that I'll just read out, right? That information is thus a name for the content of what is exchanged with the, the outer world as we adjust to it and make our adjustment felt upon it. The process of receiving and of using information is the process of our adjusting to the outer environment and of our living effectively under that environment. The needs and complexity of modern life make greater demands on this process of information than ever before. To live effectively is to live with adequate information. And so taking information like, you know, scientific stuff and just locking it up in a vault is fucking useless because information only does something when it moves. It's, it's, it's when, when information is a part of the kind of life living of of a beings and of societies, that's when it does stuff. But just like thinking of information as a commodity and patenting it and putting it on a shelf is kind of useless. He gives an example of like, when, even when he was involved in military stuff, that he was involved in three different projects in which they kind of had to like invent from scratch the same bit of math because it was kind of forbidden for the information to really flow between them or whatever. Um, I think we see that as well with like things like, um, I mean, the, the military stuff is famous for this kind of like duplication of effort, um, which could be massively saved by having, having this kind of open information. But he also kind of 
there's a, there's a really interesting thing here where he ties it in with like the nature of commodities, right? That like 19th century or 18th, 18th century and 19th century science was very focused on like matter and energy. And the commodity is kind of basically defined as a quantity that can exchange hands without losing any of its quantity. So like gold is a stable commodity because you can hand it to someone without bits of it falling off. You don't lose much of anything in trade. Um, and so that then, you know, it comes to inform our understanding of political economy. Even, it even informs like the literal matter that we exchange in, in, in our sort of social organization. But then later information theory comes along, like science moves on from the 19th century and it gets smarter. So they're not, they're no longer obsessed with matter and energy. It turns out there's this other shit called information and entropy that's related to energy, but kind of different because it, obs it observes different rules. Entropy always increases. And so it, information is lossy in a way that matter isn't. And so it is very strange to treat information as if it were a lump of matter, like a commodity, right? There's a category error to think of these things in the same way. So at one level, he's getting at the, the folks who think of intellectual property as like, you know, like buying an Xbox and just putting it on the shelf or whatever. And that's that this, this is a commodity and stuff, you know, right? That, um, or buying a teapot or something and just sticking it somewhere. Like you, you buy some IP and stick it somewhere. It does fucking nothing while it's locked away. But it, it's, it's also really interesting to me that like, it. It sort of implies that, like, maybe one of the bigger parts of this book is that, like, the advent of information theory and cybernetics is a fucking massive event in science. But because we spend our times as leftists reading texts from before that happened, it's it's not only possible, it's extremely likely that we're simply missing out on a fucking lot by going on about, you know... You know, we, we, our, our eyes are fixed on the 20 yards of linen and the two coats instead of, like, this other shit that happens and is an explosive change in our understanding of the world. That's kind of worrying, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, these systems, like, stack on top of each other. You know what I mean? Like, there's – so – They do, right? It's not, like the, it's not like the previous thing is irrelevant, but, like, there's this glaringly relevant thing here that happens in and around 1948 that it feels like most Marxists or most leftists even are – just not paying a shred of attention to. Or when they do, it's this kind of like art school fucking information society <laughs> media stuff where, oh, information communication is this kind of like art project. Whereas like for Wiener, information is the lifeblood of the organism. It's, it's a residue that is left behind by action. It's not, an, it's not like an art school thing. It's not like a media thing. And it seems like even our, even our left engagement with media communication information and stuff is in the wrong register. We need to be reading Shannon and, uh, and thinking about that, you know? Yeah, I think this kind of comes up in the context of his discussion on law and his, his uh, which is chapter seven, his like, is this like law as being a kind of moral information? You know, um, I was reading this part in the, the sort of vein of thinking about, you know, the, our current justice system, uh, with spe spe specifically with regards to uh, race, you know, like, which is o not totally in the background here because he does actually bring out um, colonization of the Americas and the way that uh, law, contract law and uh, contract under duress, contract where, you know, there's not really common terms that's, that are actually culturally in play um, and all the ways that, like, this sort of moral information can be deceptive um, before, of course, going into uh, uh, patent law. And uh, kind of, again, misreading Edison, a, a sort of liberal remnant, you know. Um, <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, I like, let's see. His, his essential, like, thing about law is that it, it should be unambiguous and it should be, like, as little subject to the whims and sort of, I guess, jurisprudence of the... Of the <laughs> of the judge as possible. It's like very it should lib, be isn't it? the whole thing. Oh, it, it, it is very lib. It's very like universalist. And, um, but th there is, there is something to this cause he's, what he's trying to avoid is bending the word. Like, and I don't know if you can really get around that. Certainly, you know, if you have a pre Hegelian, like dialectic understanding, it's all about bending the word. You know, that's, that's what, uh, that's what conversation is essentially is uh, you're changing terms. Yeah, yeah. 
I think that chapter is maybe sort of interesting for like your kind of like far future sort of communist utopia sort of thing of like, hey, look, I mean, if communication is about synchronizing and coordinating behaviors in a way that's, you know, agreeable to all, then this is the kind of stuff we should think about. But the chapter isn't especially interesting for the present because he, he's, he's missing all of that class stuff, right? Yeah, he's like, oh, well, we should put experts in with the judges. And if you object that, you know, it, we'll get the most conservative scientists and engineers. Well, that's more of a difficulty of administration than principle. That's only a problem in reality. Like, in principle, it's perfect. Like, yeah, that part's not so... That's he's right. such a fucking nerd. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> it's, it reminds me of the time that Trump was like, yeah, I'll build the wall. They might put a ladder up, but, you know... Uh, we'll do something about mm -hmm. that. You know, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like it's it's a you kind of realize mid you realize mid sentence that your own solution probably wouldn't actually mm -hmm. work. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that makes sense so long as you never think about it. Um, I I I just wanted to get back to that point, uh, Shane. You're making about like the sort of art school view of communication. Uh, since I did go through a communication program, I can kind of talk <laughs> about this a bit. You're probably better qualified than I am to speak about any of that. You know, one of the key texts uh, that is used in that kind of cultural studies milieu is uh, Encoding Decoding by Stuart Hall. Um, now, that text actually does come out of this Shannon information theory way, kind of like secondhand. Uh, but it's not understood as such in communications <laughs> like 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 people read encoding decoding they internalize hall's model of communication and that's kind of like we don't need to know where that came from like that's just Stuart hall because Stuart hall is a genius and Stuart Hall gave us this really awesome theory of like how there's a dynamic reception of information uh, rather than a purely static one. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to point out like the continuity is there. It's just not understood uh, or taught. Yeah. Is this the same? Is this the same uh, Stuart Hall, the great moving right show kind of like? Um, yep, yep, Mar yep, Marxist yep, theorist. Yeah, he's very uh, yeah. influential and popular among the sort of social reproduction, like post Althusserian set at uh, in University of Santa Cruz, for instance, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, they have a history of consciousness program, uh, which a PhD program that uh, generates a great amount of Marxist academia in this like anti humanist uh, post Althusserian kind of cultic vein, honestly. Um, it's, you know, where the, <laughs> where the distinction between like Western Marxism as a free spirited enterprise and, you know, Leninism as a scary Asiatic enterprise break down and you get this bizarre Californian hybrid. Um, so yeah, I'm actually more familiar with Stuart Hall as this like, uh, Marxist, you know, bong rip figure than as a liberal figure, but I guess, you know, these maybe... I, I, I'm not I'm not saying he's a liberal figure, I'm saying that... No, 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 no not at all. He, being... was, he was drawing on communication theory when he wrote that essay, which is just kind of a fundamental, like, 101 text in communication these days. Fair. It's, it's similar to the reading of Debord that you get in similar circles, is where I was going with this, that strips... Like, it's hard to read Debord and not get the fucking Marxism, but, like... If you just want to talk about Facebook and, you know, kind of like pivot around production, let's not talk about that. Like, let's only kind of focus on uh, the spectacle and the emergent system. Um, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I did not go through a communications program, um, for the record. Uh, I, yeah. Well, um, it's, yeah, it's just, as I said, it's, it's just, uh, it's a fundamental text uh, in terms of like, kind of motivating like the the reader response view of, of of media theory which is like really important to cultural studies because like cultural studies is kind of all about seeing the play of agency in reception of media right uh like oh like subcultures are dynamic and they make of the mass media they consume what they will and there's a kind of active subject there uh, and so the decoding side of encoding decoding is really important to 
justifying that project. Uh, but it, you know, yeah, that, that fills in a lot of gaps for me actually. Like, uh, in terms of the like thought processes behind like uh, the cultural turn inside and outside of Marxism, I think what you just described there, Kyle, is probably closer to the Weinerian sort of perspective on things. Because I think maybe the, what I was trying to get at earlier is that there's this kind of what's that thing where it's like, oh, the the medium is the message. Actually, I think is the the thing I was trying to get at. But then I think for for for, for Weiner, it's actually quite the opposite that the message is the medium through which life is lived. That like. B b social behavior and even organic behavior is synchronized by information pulses. Um, and it's a, I was reading a book a while ago that was um, actually about information theory directly, but there was some nice anecdotes from like when the telegraph was invented and how people struggled to really understand what was happening when these little electrical things, eh, they didn't really totally understand what electricity was. They, they were struggling to come up with this vocabulary to describe it. But what the person, the author of the book pointed out was there was a couple of choice little quotes that like absolutely fucking nail it right from the start and one of those people was saying that like you know his contemporaries were saying like oh well it's as if the message is sent you know and they're trying to reason about it in terms of like sending letters right like, like the information is a little object that moves through space whatever and this other person was like no 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 no. when you tap that key nothing is being sent anywhere two machines are being f are, are exhibiting exactly the same behavior remotely that the, the behavior of the machines is synchronized at a distance. That's what's happening. And it appears to us as if some particle of information is exchanged. Um, much in the same way, if you look at two people dancing, like this tango or whatever, you, you think like, oh, wow, they're really communicating very deeply with each other. But they're, they're not like ex exchanging like dance yulons or whatever, or dance particles back and forth. There's nothing moving back and forth between them. But their behavior is synchronized, and that's what we see. But we have, a, we have a weird perceptual bias towards identifying objects. So we identify like the communication as if it was an object. But for Wiener, it's the behavior and the change in behavior is the, is the real show. And this information is a residue that's kind of left behind or a residue that seems to slip off of things as this, as this behavior changes. Um, so that's, those are the two contrasting sort of things, I think. And I think the thinking of the objectness of, of information is probably the wrong way to think about that sort of stuff. The, the Wienerian way of thinking about it is that like matter synchronizes itself by communicating, which is pretty odd. Um, anyway, um, I think the last couple of chapters then, like chapter 10 is pretty interesting, right? We've got like the first and second industrial revolutions. Um, to kind of gloss over some of it, um, like the first industrial revolution basically like starts to replace um, human muscle power. Like this is where he gets back into this automation thing, right? It replaces human muscle power, um, but retains this like craft skill sort of stuff because the, the machines need to be maintained. Um, crucially also like getting a lot of physical force into one place required a lot of capital investment. And so all of the mills and stuff had to be brought into one big shed, a factory to keep them in the place where the driver was because you couldn't transmit physical force very far. Um, then later, and so like, so you have the thing of like, you have this extremely expensive plant and capital that transmits physical force automatically and allows for this, this change in the mode of production. Um, the instrument maker is involved there in like keeping all the shit running. Like you have to be pretty damn clever about how you design those kind of shafts so that they don't lose a ton of energy as, as they rotate. Um, then the next industrial revolution is the sort of electrical, electronic, cybernetic revolution where these kinds of machine systems, these kinds of like power things can be controlled using low energy circuits. And you don't need to keep all of the mills in one building anymore. You can have a bunch of little motors spread out all over the place and they don't suffer from the same problem. They don't have massive energy loss. You can have like a, a giant fucking crane or whatever that's is directing massive amounts of force, but it's directing it under the control of a teeny little microchip. It's very low energy. So the, the shift in engineer, engineering shifts away from these massive like physical, like, you know, like brute physical sort of high energy systems towards engineering these like very low energy systems and engineering them very cleverly. And then they control the other things. So this ends up, this brings us from the threat of replacing human muscle power to the threat of replacing both human muscle power and human brain power, because this eventually gets us to computing and we're back into the realm of learning machines and, you know, little, little control circuits that can learn to direct the crane much more effectively than a human could ever do. Um, this is a very interesting read on these, these two revolutions, right? And I, again, this, this brings up that echo of like, I'm, I'm not totally sure that a lot of Marxists have caught up with the second, the second, uh, revolution, um, in quite the same way as they have with the first one. Yeah. 
<laughs> we are stuck in the past. Um, the entire second phase of capitalism has more or less passed by the, at least the political end of Marxism, because I think that's really what we're talking about here, our forms of organization and the expectation that we're about to, you know, break out in a guerrilla war. This is even sort of like, like internalized, um, in a lot of radicalizing liberals, you know, they expect that God, things are at such a head and we're at, we're in such a sort of antagonistic social space, we got to prepare for war. There's going to be open conflict. It just can't keep going like this. Helter, skelter, look out. Um, ultimately, though, what if this second phase of capitalism has a lot of names in the literature? You know, the, the clumsiest one is real subsumption too, which might even get into it. The, the best is that, you know, not only is the production process being reconfigured, by the capital circuit, or really sort of like most of life is reconfigured by the capital, uh, by the value production circuit. Um, and, and it's, it's not merely the production process, but like, you know, everything, like the, the entire like way of doing things, like, um, even like whole economies cease to be productive of the necessities of life in a sort of Ricardian comparative advantage, like, yeah, we'll just put all food production over there. We don't need to do that. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's also really interesting to me that Wiener predicts here the, the, the dispersal, right? That like, you know, there was, there was a gathering together in the factory because the physical plant and like the machine, the, the force, literal physical, like physics force was concentrated in one place. But with the development of control engineering and like electronics and cybernetics and stuff, you can, you can have shit spread out fucking everywhere. And, you know, calling back to the previous chapter where, where a person's word goes, their, their, they go, right? That the projection of control electronically and the projection of control via information rather than via um, a, a rotating iron shaft is a very significant change and it disperses things. And like, I mean, it's similar, like the Corbin thing here, right? Like this, this like whole fucking left project that was based on a mode of, it was an, an assumption of a mode of protection that simply doesn't exist here anymore because there aren't any, there aren't any fucking factories. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all fucking IT bullshit in this country now, you know? Yeah. No, the sh strategic thinking is profoundly like linked to the collective worker th that emerges from the factory form. And it, it is painfully outmoded, uh, painfully outmoded. And there is, there hasn't been like a Marxist sort of practice that really, um, speaks to it other than stuff borrowed from anarchism, which, and the more romantic side of anarchism, which is more or less like, you know, build vitalistic sort of like try to inject vitalism into this entropy machine or, um, well, I will, I will once again, bring up Stuart Hall here, uh, because, uh, this is kind of what they were grappling with on New Times, right? When the was it the CPGB when it was still like a actual party, not a weird think tank thing, um, uh, in its sort of process of disintegration, uh, they created New Times to try to think through these problems. Um, and the result that came out of that was New Labour and Blairism. Uh, so that is also a Marxist project yeah. that tried to think through these things, which was not inspired by anarchism. No, no, that's true. You, you either go Bernstein or Bakunin. You know what I mean? There's there, it doesn't, it, we've yet to arrive at a Marxian praxis that relies on, you know, the permanent institutions of the proletariat as an independent social power from the state and capital. Well, at least, in, at least in the first world, let's say the that's the important caveat, because there is still a lot of industrialization in the third world. I mean, it didn't it didn't just disappear completely. It wasn't all automated because you know of low labor rates in the third world. It all got shoved there, and so that's where you're seeing a lot of labor militancy and even mass communist parties. This is true, but e even in places where there is like still production happening, you know, Shuang is good about documenting this in China. That they can also organize the service sector. You know what I mean, and like uh, now that might be part of the historical dynamic of, um, you know, the move from the country being in living memory. But, um, you know, flying back to where we live for a moment, like that's all well and good. We haven't even come up with a way to meaningfully support those efforts here. Like 
because if that is the, you know, the central working class dynamic or, or what have you, like, we're either completely useless to that, you know, or we can do anything to sort of like bolster some notion of the inter international working class that has meaning that isn't just paving over uh, differences in, you know, national incomes or what have you. Um, hey, I'm, I'm subscribed to fucking Schwang's Patreon. I'm supporting that shit. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> th that's right. That's right. Talk about information and power, you know, subscribe to Patreon anyway. Um, more, more or less, like, we don't have anything local or, or, or even, you know, within our, within our, like, where we are. Where we are. That, that's the primary appeal of flying to a different place or time for leftists, particularly Marxists, is that, um, you know, it's, an, w our grapplings here have not been very fruitful as a research program. You basically have to broaden your scope. You can't stay uh, fixated on the, the sacred texts and come up with meaningful engagement here, which is disturbing, it, genuinely. Like, it's, you know, not something I take lightly. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, it's a big reason why either, as a Marxist, you get very open-minded to the point where uh, the capital M Marxists say, you're not a Marxist, or you become a very narrow cultist. Like, and there seems to be very little in between. Um, and now, in part, in those people that get, you know, in that first category, yeah, you have <laughs> new labor and all kinds of conservatizing tendencies. You have, like, um, Platypus and Spiked and, you know, Telos Magazine and, and or Telos Journal and, and all these things that take, like, high-level critical theory and turn it into the, you know, like, pseudo-aristocratic discourse it was destined to be. And then you have people that you know, are, are going in this, like, really kind of desperate, but I think quite ethically understandable, um, you know, anarchist vitalist, like, I'm going to go out and, you know, spray paint a building right now because, you know, I, that's the only thing I can even possibly think of that, that you know, will make me feel a little freer right now. Um, yeah, like, the, 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 the die is cast, you know? <laughs> Our work is cut out for us, like... We, we, we still have the same, the same strategic issue here, and um, if you want to get into the scariest part of the, of the chess game that's coming up, you know, in later chapters, it's that there seems to be learning only on one side. There seem, th that's the, the importance of institutions, or, or, you know, the purported importance of institutions, is the ability to collect strategic information and learn. Uh, there is yet to be a non-organizational sort of proletarian uh, response to that that is capable of accumulating tactics and strategically learning. That's the thing that makes the pro like the proletarian subjection to capital right now seem hopeless and desperate. And that that's the whole thing that actually drives you know any my any interest in in organization on the part of socialists because everything I've seen in my experience shows me that. Um, it's almost wholly counterproductive in my, in my anecdotal experience. And I have to rationally reconstruct the idea that, yeah, but like, there's no way. <laughs> there's, there's kind of no way out of this uh, unless there can be some sort of strategic accumulation on the part of the proletariat. There needs to be some sort of, you know, there needs to be some kind of emergent, like, literature and self there that, that can respond to the mega agent right or or the or the or the system yeah it's it's very much like ashby's law right like like Ash, ashby's law can be formulated as like um in a conflict between two systems the one with the wider repertoire of strategies and possible responses to actions and the better ability to select strategies and actions will generally tend to win um that the the higher variety system tends to squash the lower variety system in in this kind of long-running game theory thing yeah, so, you know, turning yourself into a Leninist militant is the most counterproductive thing possible. You know, squishing your variability and, and adaptability and making yourself only sort of fit for uh, literary circles or whatever is, is bonkers. It's like, the, did the FBI create this strategy? No, but they could have, functionally speaking, in order to, like, kneecap us as, as effectively as possible.
Well, that's it for this episode. Join us again next time when we pick up part three and the final part of our discussion of the human use of human beings. In the meantime, you can find us on Twitter at GIUnitPod. We're on Facebook, we're on all the podcast apps, so like, rate, and subscribe. You can also find us on the internet at generalintellectunit.net. If you go to patreon.com slash generalintellectunit, you can throw us a couple of bucks a month to get access to our community Discord, where we hang around and talk about cybernetic communism, and also host a reading series where the community comes together to read and discuss Stafford Beer's Brain of the Firm. You may also have noticed that we've been releasing the recorded sessions for that reading group on the main feed. This show is part of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast network and research collective. Go to emancipation.network and check out our sister shows such as Swampside Chats, Mortal Science, Jumpsuit Utopia, and From Alpha to Omega. They're wonderful shows and wonderful folks. Until next time, keep your boots clean, your feet out of the swamp, and your head in the revolutionary clouds of tomorrow.